Hey, good morning. Welcome to, well, good morning from here. Welcome to VSPG. Today we have present, a presentation by Dr. Jan Peter Duda, Grow with the Flow, Exploring the Geobiology of Ancient Seepage Habitats. Next week, we have a presentation from Dr. Lydia Tarhan from Yale University titled Life and Death in the Ediacaran, Evolutionary, Environmental, and Preservational Dynamics. Let me make sure I can see. Yes, that's all right. And then again, we after that, we get to hear from Dr. Elizabeth Turner again, who stepped in very quickly to a recent drop, a recent opening on April 14th. So um, we're very grateful to her for that. Um, so without any further announcements, Andre is going to introduce our speaker today for us. Uh, thanks, Alex. Uh, just before I introduce, uh, we, uh, so we are going to continue this series until uh, middle of June, and when uh, we will take a break uh, for summer. Uh, and we started already working on schedule for Titan on September 8th. Uh, so some of you will get emails asking if you want to contribute. And if you have uh, some ideas who would be a good speaker, uh, send it to us or add it to, to a list uh, that we have on, uh, on Google. Uh, Alex uh, suggested, and we will do something uh, different around uh, uh, November, December, and maybe January. So we're planning uh, to let people from Asia and Australia to talk. And as a result of it, uh, at what time talks will be late in the day around uh, 5 p.m. for the West Coast. So, uh, so we'll try how it works. Um, and uh, and uh, we, we will be filling up slots until de December now. Uh, okay, with this, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Jean-Peter Duda. Uh, Duda is originally from, uh, Jean-Peter is from uh, Germany. He did his uh, uh, bachelor and master degree in the University of Bremen. And when he moved to University of uh, Göttingen for PhD, uh, with Reitner, and um, he sort of combined uh, various aspects of sedimentary uh, geology uh, on uh, petrographic scale, but uh, also organic geochemistry. And he worked on uh, two ends of Precambrian. He worked on very early Archean record, but he will talk today but also he spent about uh, six months uh, visiting Nanjin Institute of Geology and working uh, with uh, scientists from there on, uh, on a dear current record from South China. Uh, he then uh, stayed for postdoc at Göttingen and um, spent uh, one year here with uh, uh, Gordon Love uh, visiting and funded by uh, German uh, Foundation, and uh, uh, during that time he developed interest in when eukaryotes uh, emerged and become a, uh, important contributors to organic matter, and uh, he also worked with Russian scientists uh, with, uh, from Siberia on neoproterozoic stuff, and uh, uh, so now he is based in University of Tübingen, uh, which I think uh, sort of uh, somewhat uh, leading to a permanent position. And uh, as I understand, might be moving um, uh, in future. Okay, with this, I pass it to Jean-Peter. And you're muted. Yeah. Yes, but now you should. Hear me clearly. Yeah, many thanks, Andre, also Alex, for the invitation and the introduction. And hi, everyone. Really great to be with you today and uh, to have the chance to, you know, to explore with you the geobiology of some very ancient seepage habitats, which 
a really fascinating world and I hope you enjoy it. But um, let me start with, with a view of the modern earth and a picture of Gaia, the Greek goddess of, of the earth. Some of you may notice that I sneaked this picture already into my front slide. And uh, the reason is not only that I'm interested in ancient frescoes, uh, as one may suspect, but rather that Gaia, of course, is the symbol of the living earth, right? We all know today, at least most of us do, that in the same way that environments have an influence on organisms, organisms influence environments. So uh, uh, if you think about you know, the evolution of the earth system, uh, you always have to consider that it's a tale of co-evolution. So this is very important. Also then, if you want to understand how the modern world came into being, right? So because it means that we need to develop a robust understanding, not only about geobio interaction in shallow time where we have fossils and, and all, but also in the very distant past. And this is something I, I would like to focus on today. Um, so um, on rocks, um, dating back to 3.5 to 3.4 billion years ago, approximately, and see what we can get out of it. So deep time geobiology it is. And uh, actually, if, if you think about it operationally, there are two aspects to it. First, of course, we have to make the case for life being present somewhere in the past uh, by means of biosignatures. This sounds a little trivial to, to many colleagues actually working on better mosaic stuff, but as you all know, in, in the Precambrian it's quite challenging. And uh, the simple reason is that many features that are typically produced by biology and hence could be used as biosignature can also be produced under special conditions or specific conditions by abiotic processes. So what we are usually left with is this field of ambiguous um, signatures where we cannot really tell whether it was biology or not. And uh, this is the this is one thing. Um, we still can make it. I, I'll try to demonstrate how we can do that. Uh, but then, of course, once we accomplish this, there's the second question, which is perhaps even more important if it comes to you know geobiology, is to understand which nature this life was, right? We have to understand metabolic processes because this is what will influence the environment. So uh, from identification to understanding, if you like. So today, I would like to focus on hydrothermal systems. Uh, the reason for this is simply because they were very widespread on the early Earth. I think this is um, 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 common sense. Uh, but, and this is also important, they have been critical for the early evolution of life, perhaps even its origins. Uh, and the problem that we face, and this is a little something I also want to illustrate today is that, oh, sorry, no matter which type of hydrothermal system we're talking about, whether it's rather deep sea, like these alkaline vents shown here, very spectacular, or hot ponds in terrestrial settings, in all these settings, ecosystems will be strongly influenced by fluid seepage, but also taphonomic processes. So this means if you think about biosignatures and how to interpret them, uh, it's quite a challenging thing. And we really have to think around the corner in many cases. Okay, today I would focus on rocks from the Pilbara Craton in Northwestern Australia. You all know this, I'm, I'm pretty sure, located uh, in the Northern part of Western Australia. Um, these rocks here um, are very interesting because they are very well preserved, at least if it comes to, you know, Archean time scales. And I will, as I already mentioned, focus on rocks that date back to 3.5 to 3.4 billion years. Um, the important thing is because they are well preserved and or they haven't seen much metamorphism, I should say, we still find uh, broad evidence for the presence of diverse microbial life. Uh, which is very important. Many studies, excellent studies on this, for example, on facies and morphologies. Think about stromatolites, the classic, I would say, uh, putative microfossils, usually very disputed. I don't want to go into that. And various geochemical evidence. Okay, so we have a bunch of evidence preserved there. Some 
perhaps more convincing, some less convincing, but it's there. And the important thing now is that all of these habitats uh, were influenced by hydrothermal processes, okay? And it's really a good study site to, you know, understand the influence of such processes on ecosystems better and to see what it means um, for, for early organisms. Today, I would like to focus on, you know, selected cases. One is the Strelipool formation, 3.4 billion years old. This will be the first part of the talk. In the second part, I would like to delve deeper into time and have a closer look to the Dresser formation and uh, you know, to, to explore this in a little greater detail. In all these cases, I will try to elucidate the impact of seepage on the ecosystems. And as mentioned before, also do a, do a few considerations about you know, uh, taphonomic processes and what this means. Okay, so let's move on. First part, 3.4 billion year old Strelly formation. Um, consisting of churts and carbonates. And this formation is very famous for its beautifully preserved stromatolites. This is a photo I took myself, but you will find similar photos in uh, numerous textbooks and papers. It's really, really beautiful. I won't talk about this though. I will talk about a facies that uh, follows on top of these classic stromatolites and which looks like this. This black shirt, it's a black shirt facies, but you see also that there are white areas in. And uh, I hope that I can convince you that this facies also is a microbial net facies, okay? So even though it doesn't look like a classic stromatolite, um, I'm convinced that this is also a microbial net facies and it's all about taphonomy. Okay, so keep this picture in mind, but we stay in the, in the field for a little longer. This facies also has shows intercalated stromatolite beds like this smaller one. And as I already mentioned, it's associated with these classical uh, stromatolites below. Another interesting feature that you can observe in the field is that some interlayers like this one here show structures like this, which I would interpret as roll up structure. Roll-up structure is typically formed if you have sediment stabilization, and then you have wave agitation or hydrodynamic agitation, I should say, and you, you know, affect the surface sediment. And if it's stabilized, it will bend like this. This is typically the case if you have microbial mats, for example, they can do that. So maybe um, think about the alternative explain if you have an environment where you have a soft ground, no stabilization at all, and you would ha have hydrodynamic you know, agitation going on, you would swirl everything up, perhaps it would resettle, perhaps it would be transported elsewhere, but you would not, you know, form structures like this. So a typical indicator for the presence of microbiome mats, and you even see like a faint lamination preserved within. Another feature of this facies, um, you can find at the top actually, are ripple structures. Um, here you see cross beds, just indicating waves or currents. I don't want to overinterpret this, but of course, such structures you commonly find in very shallow water environments. I'm not saying that you can't find cross bedding structures in deeper environments, but of course, uh, it's more typical, so to speak, for environments where you have constant hydrodynamic processes going on. So let's take this as evidence um, for a shallow water environment. Now let's go to the lab and have a look into fin sections. Uh, so this is a transmitted light uh, picture. And you see that the facies consists of these, or is composed of these fine grain shirts. This is what makes the facies black, if you like. And then you have these, these spaces here that are filled with coarse grained shirt. Okay, this, this is the, the, are these bright white areas. This is one important thing. Another important thing is, you may know that all these surfaces appear to be like undulating. The whole thing seems to be inflated a little. So it, it doesn't seem to be compacted, so to speak. Um, this will be important uh, 
uh, later on if we think about the taphonomy of the whole thing. But now for the moment, just take this, the, the visual appearance, so to speak, the association of these fine grain layers, and then these um, yeah, um, larger ones filled by coarse grained materials. Now have a look into this photo here. This is a carbonate facies, to be more specific, car Triassic carbonate microbialites that build up yeah, most of the Calcareous Alps in Europe, actually. And these were formed in very shallow environments, intertidal depressions in lagoons. So why am I bringing this up here? You may know that you again have layers composed of very fine grained material. And in between you have these um, um, zones that are filled with um, coarse grained material, okay? So somewhat similar to what we've seen before with one important uh, um, um, uh, difference, of course, expect for, uh, except the, the, the age, which is this, this is carbonate you know, all over the place, no chert whatsoever. But the overall picture, just the appearance looks quite similar, although a little bit more compacted, I would say. So also this will be important a little later on. So now I was talking first about black shirt facies. Now I compared it to a carbonate facies. How about carbonates in this black shirt facies? Is there any evidence that we might have had some? And the answer is yes. This is one example. You see these needle shaped uh, crystals in cross section. If you cross cut them horizontally, you will see that there are pseudo hexagonal prisms. So which is? In concert, a good indication that these might have been aragonite crystals. Now it's chert, so it would be pseudomorphs after aragonite. Uh, but I think uh, this explanation is, um, I mean, it makes sense. We also find carbonates that are still preserved as carbonates. Uh, for example, dolomite ROMs, rather the exception. Uh, we tested this by means of Raman spectroscopy, so we are really sure that this mineralogy is true. So we have dolomite present, and we even have calcite present. These are cathodoluminescent microscopic images. Um, cathodoluminescence is very nice for carbonates because they, they shine and glue in these orange colors. This is an overlay photo, so over, it was overlain over a thin section photograph, but you see that you have these tiny uh, calcite. Uh, crystals within uh, organic lamina. So very distinct. And if you zoom in, you see that these are globular aggregates, actually. And again, closely associated with organic matter. So we have pseudomorphs after aragonite, we have dolomite, and we have calcite present in these black shirt facies. So this intrigued us. And you've already got a sense that it's a kind of like top-down approach from the field to thin section microscopy uh, further on. So now we go, we have a really detailed look by means of secondary ion mass spectrometry, um, which allows you to map elements in isotopes, for examples, in samples. Um, the principle, very roughly speaking, I don't want to swamp you with details, is that you uh, shoot uh, primary ions on your sample. And by this, uh, secondary ions will be emitted and these you can then analyze. And um, there are different te SIMS techniques. This here is nano SIMS. And as the uh, name already says, actually, you can go down really to the nano scale. Uh, we didn't get that close, but we uh, zoomed in quite a bit. And this is what we found. On the left-hand side, you see enrichment maps. Okay, so here enrichments of 12 carbon and down here of nitrogen. And what you see is that you have these clusters of spheroidal bodies, and these seem to be enriched in carbon all over the place. If you now look to the distribution of nitrogen and also sulfur, it would show the same. These things are only you know, enriched at the edges of these, of these bodies, as you can see here. This is maybe perhaps gets more clearer if you look at this cross section here, which corresponds to the x-axis here. So if you start at the edge, you have co-enrichments of carbon, of sulfur, and of nitrogen. And if you mo move towards the center, 
you will only find enrichments of carbon. And if you move further and proceed, you'll again, at the other edge, and you reach the other edge, you again have enrichments of carbon, of sulfur, and of nitrogen. So this is very interesting, not only because of the overall morphology, but also because nitrogen and carbon are usually co-enriched if you have organic matter, which means that in the centers, you don't have organic matter. Now, the hypothesis, of course, is that these enrichments here are also caused by carbonates uh, because we know them to be present in the spacious, and this would nicely explain uh, this pattern that we observe. We also applied other SIMS techniques, uh, time of flight SIMS, for example, where you can basically do the same. Um, again, I don't want to get into too much into detail, but what you can see is, of course, you have enrichments of silica all over the place. Makes sense. It's the chert facies. But then in certain layers, you have also uh, enrichments of calcium, most likely due to the presence of carbonates. This is the easiest explanation for it and also associated with, with it organic matter. So again, you have a close association um, and this pattern kind of recurs. Okay, I've talked now about carbonate, jert, silica, carbonates, and organic matter, but I also mentioned that we found some sulfur enrichments that might reflect pyrite. Why do I come to this conclusion? Here's why. This is again a thin section photo uh, uh, pic, but it's reflected light. And you see that you have these brownish layers. This is organic matter. We confirmed this with Raman spectroscopy. And associated with this, very closely, you have these beautifully preserved pyrite crystals. I mean, this is a surface sample. No reoxidation uh, re whatsoever. Very, very nice. And the question, of course, is what does this mean? And we try to find this out by zooming in again using scanning electron microscopy. And this is what we found. We found that the um, pyrite was kind of, again, spheroidal in shape, not euhedral or so like you usually observe it in these faces, but really this roundish. So I would say, for me, it really looks quite similar to uh, pyrite thromboids in, in modern sediments or in ancient rocks, which are typically formed if uh, microbial sulfate reduction is involved. So this might fingerprint uh, microbial sulfur turnover in the microbial mat. Um, unfortunately, um, sulfur isotopes don't tell us much about it. They are consistent with biology, but they are not indicative of. So, um, but I think still, if you take all these evidence together, this is the, mo uh, the best explanation. I remember the first time that I met Andre in South Africa, he told me it doesn't look uh, like thromboidal pyrite to him. I don't know whether he changed his uh, idea about this, but I would be happy to discuss this later on. Would be something after, I don't know, several years. <laughs> okay, but now just move on for a moment. We have all these features, all these evidences, which in combination, from my perspective, are more, uh, the easiest explanation is that you have biology involved. But of course, one question you have to answer is, how can you preserve all these features? Now, why is, for example, the pyrite that nicely preserved, embedded in this chert matrix? Why do you have still all these detailed structures preserved? Why does the facious seems to be little compacted only. And uh, to find this out, best you can do is to check for analog settings. And of course, if we talk about a key and stuff, you will never find a one-to-one -one analog. This is always important to keep in mind. You can only find analogs that help you to explain certain aspects. So now if it comes to the preservation of this microbiomat, I think one suitable taphonomic analog is the Devonian Rhiney shirt. What you find there is a very detailed and minute preservation of very fragile organisms like cyanobacteria shown here. And look at the detail. And the reason that you have this kind of preservation is that these organisms thrived in a kind of hydrothermal pond environment, if you like. And these settings get occasionally, you know, uh, influenced by hydrothermally derived silica rich fluids, which kind of impregnated what 
ever happen to be there at this very moment. So you create a snapshot if you like. Um, now you think, okay, this is another fossil example. And um, also here, we may don't have a good control about facies and, and, and stuff. But in fact, we also find this in modern environments or you know, environments uh, that are not very old. Think about modern hydrothermal ponds like Iceland. You can see these things happening. And uh, Manuel Reinhardt, who did his PhD in Göttingen, is working on Lake Magadi a lot. And he found in these Lake Magadi uh, sediments the same thing. Huh? You have an excellent preservation of features from the macroscopic scale down to, to microns, several microns and such. So I think uh, this is really a good way to explain what we observe. And it would also be a consistent once again with a biological origin of the whole thing. So my idea is that these were microbial mats that you know thrived in a shallow water setting and at some point got impregnated by hydrothermally derived silica fluids, which explains um, the preservation of it as we find it. So I would like to leave this part for the moment. I think I'm rushing a little through. I'm very sorry for that, but uh, there's still a little bit to come. And uh, so let's continue with the dresser formation, 3.5 billion years old, Pilbara. Dresser formation consists of a variety of different things, sedimentary chures, stromatolites, but also hydrothermal veins like the ones you see here that cross-cut um, footwall basaltic rocks. And the whole dresser setting is interpreted as volcanic caldera setting that also includes like micro niches, if you like, environmentally speaking, such as small ponds. Um, this interpretation comes from Martin von Gandong, who did really much work in this area. And all things I've seen are very convincing to me, at least. Now, we were very interested in these hydrothermal churd veins, and here's why. On the left-hand side, you see the basaltic rocks that are cross-cut by these veins. You may note that these are white in color, which appears strange perhaps first, but this is because of hydrothermal um, alteration within the, in the sediment. So now you're looking at kaolinite actually. And cross-cutting, you have these hydrothermal chert veins and you see it's very black. And the reason for its color is that it contains quite a bit of organic carbon. And this is a little strange, right? You have the hydrothermal chert vein that cross-cuts basaltic rocks, and this is full of organic matter. Where does the organic matter come from? What did it come from? Sorry. So first, of course, you would think about biology, right? The simple reason is from the tiniest microbe up to the top predator in ecosystems, they all life that we know consists of organic carbon. So that would be an easy explanation, perhaps, but the problem is that, of course, we also know that there's organic matter from abiotic sources and that these sources might have been more important on the very early Earth. Sources could be endogenous ones, like in the atmosphere, you have processes going on that could deliver some you know, organic matter. Geological processes associated with hydrothermal processes, keyword here, fischer tropsch type processes. I will talk on this a little bit later on, but also exogenous. Uh, so impacts, you bring something in um, like uh, with meteorites or so. And it's not only that all these things could deliver organic matter to environments. Uh, this organic matter also can have uh, uh, delta 13C signatures that are similar to you know, ranges that are commonly consistent, um, considered being indicative for biological sources. So. Uh, in other words, uh, we cannot really tell just because we find organic matter and it has a certain stable carbon isotopic composition that it was formed by biology. This is a very uh, big problem. And whenever you work with old material like this and you do anything with organic, you will always have at least one reviewer who's asking uh, about that. Can you be really sure that it was biology? So coming back to the dresser formation, this was the question we then had and others had before us actually, is the organic matter in these veins biological in origin or not? And uh, of course it's tempting to speculate that it's not because it's associated with pillow basaltic rocks. So um, this is really 
a question that we found uh, intriguing. So we decided to have a closer look. So on the left hand side here, you see a thin section microscopic image. It's transmitted light again. And you see here these black opaque uh, crystals. These are um, uh, pyrite crystals. And then you see all these dark grayish areas. This is organic matter, okay? We confirmed this by means of Raman spectroscopy. And if you check the stable carbon isotopic composition of the bulk organic matter, you'll find that it's in the range of, you know, in the biological range, let's say so, okay? So this of course could point to a biological origin, but as just mentioned, it does not necessarily have to be the case. So we have to learn more. And one way to do this is of course, to zoom down to the molecular level. And I apologize that I have to bore you for one slide with terminology, but it's really necessary to understand the argumentation now. If we talk about organic matter and ancient rocks, usually we distinguish two you know, fractions, so to speak. And these are only by definition, uh, the bitume, which is the solvent extractable proportion of organic matter, okay? So you can use organic solvents to get the stuff out. The reason is very simplified speaking that it consists of single molecules, okay? So in other words, it's easy to access this organic matter and these molecules, but of course, as you see here already, it's a fluid. And you've all heard about oil migration and things like that. So these things might migrate through rocks, right? So you cannot be sure really that if you extract something out of your rock that it really belongs to the rock, so to say. More interesting sometimes is then the kerogen fraction, which is by de definition. And again, only by definition, the proportion of organic matter in a given rock that is not extractable, okay? The reason for that is that molecules are covalently bound forming these networks. And because of this network or net kind of structure, um, it's not mobile. It doesn't behave like a fluid. It stays in place, at least in sedimentary environments. So in other words, the kerogen might be a good target if you want to uh, learn more. And we gave it a shot. Um, I will come to that uh, next sli slide after that. First, perhaps just a few words on how we can analyze, you know, the, the molecular makeup of organic matter anyways. One important technique, of course, is gas chromatography mass spectrometry, GCMS. Very simplified speaking, you have an oven, and then in this oven, you have a capillary column that looks like this. You inject your sample, and then you push this this sample through and you will get a separation of molecules over time uh, and you detect um, the, the molecules then back here. Um, just to give you a figure, just imagine you have a very small molecule and then just imagine a, a very big molecule. It's easily, I think, easy to, to comprehend that the small molecule will pass through this column much you know, quicker and faster as, as the, as the uh, bigger one. But anyways, this is one technique. We will get a separation over time, we can detect these things. But what we then do with mass spectrometry, then we destroy these molecules once they pass. We will fragment them because based on these fragments, we can you know, identify the previous structure molecular buildup of this very compound. So we, in combo, these two things are really powerful tool to you know, identify organic molecules in samples. So this is very good and it works very nicely with things that you can just extract, but it doesn't work with kerogen because all the molecules are covalently bound. You cannot get this through. So you have to apply other techniques. And one very famous uh, technique for this is catalytic hydropyrolysis, short high pi. And what you do is you take your sample, you uh, extract everything off so that all the bitume is gone until you are left with a very kerogen. And then you put the kerogen into the high pi um, instrument up here, and you will apply a constant stream of hydrogen flowing through. Hydrogen, so very reducing. And what you will then do is that you will apply pressures of 150 bars approximately, and you will heat the system up from ambient temperature progressively to 520 degrees Celsius. And the result is that little by little, one after the other, you will crack single compounds out of this network. And because of this hydrogen steam, you will just carry them down 
to a cold spot and you will trap them there. So there will be no further alteration of whatever you released from this carogen network. And what you create by this is kind of artificial bitume, okay? So in other words, HiPi simulates, if you want, a sample that goes to the oil window. But anyways, this is a very strong, uh, powerful technique. And once you have this artificial bitume, of course, this then you can um, again analyze with GCMS, so the technique that I just introduced before. So a very powerful um, combo. And as I already said, we tried this also with very old materials. And here's what we found from a kerogen from such a from, from one of these dresser um, um, hydrothermal uh, veins. What you see here is a, is a chromatogram. So on the x-axis you have retention time, goes from left to right. Then on the y-axis you have relative intensity, and you see all these peaks here. Each of these peaks represent at least one uh, molecule, and you see that I labeled uh, some of them with a black circle. These are N alkanes, okay? So just straight chain hydrocarbons. And the important thing now is that they differ in the number of carbon atoms. Um, so you have a less amount of carbon atoms on the left-hand side, and then the molecules will increase to, towards the right. So this one here, for example, has 14 carbon atoms. This one has 18. But the important thing now really is that if you look beyond that, you will have a marked uh, decrease of n alkanes in abundance. You have a kind of step, which is kind of funny because similar things you can observe if you do high pi with uh, bacterial biomass, which is shown here. Same thing, you can just, it's the same symbols and all. You again see that you end up with chain length up to 18 carbon atoms, but not much beyond. Um, a very distinct step. So what could be the explanation? In case of the cyanobacterium, of course, you could take also other bacteria. It's of that organisms use templates when forming matter. And it really doesn't matter which matter they form. Right? It can be a bone, can be you know, a lipid, for a cell membrane, for example, these things have a function. And so they are constructed, you know, after certain templates, so to speak. Now, this is what brings the step in here. It might be an explanation for the step that we observe here. But what about hydrothermal organic matter, abiotic organic matter? To understand this better, um, we conducted numerous uh, experiments. Um, I should say Helge did this in his PhD, uh, fischer tropsch type synthesis of organic matter under hydrothermal conditions. Uh, really, he, he did so many experiments and what we found always, and this is important, we always found that the products look like this. You have kind of unimodal distributions. I'm not sure if this is the right wording, but you know what I mean, right? It really looks roundish. You never, never ever we saw kind of step like we observed here, okay? So this is a very, very difference. And we think that this is a good indication that these molecules here um, are biological in origin. Now, this is from the dresser formation. Similar features have been described from the Strelipool formation where um, Marshall and colleagues did the same. And you, you see, again, you have NLKs, these are NLKs. You have them up to 18 carbon atoms, but you don't have much beyond that. You have, again, this sharp uh, step. So this might be indicative for biological origin of at least these molecules and hence by extension parts, at least of the organic matter contained within these hydrothermal churn veins. Um, if you buy the study, then of course you will ask, why did it end up there in the first place? And uh, our idea about this is that we had kind of hydrothermal pump uh, operating. So we had this large scale circulation of hydrothermal fluids going on. These fluids penetrated and percolated through the, the crust. And what you will have then, of course, is also accumulation and redistribution of organic matter, that, which is present in the environment. And uh, this is not uh, science fiction or anything. In fact, these processes are well known from modern hydrothermal environments. And again, it's, it doesn't matter what type of hydrothermal environment. Uh, it's true for the deep ocean. It's true for hydrothermal ponds. 
It's true for Magali and all these things. So these are really mechanisms that we can, you know, trace also today. So, so much about this. I would now shift focus to another interesting story uh, that is uh, hidden, so to speak, in, in the dresser formation. And for the best start for this is, is looking at this photo here. It's a field photograph again. What you see is uh, barite here, down here. It's kind of blackish, dark gray. I, I emphasize this because you have also um, pure curing barites that are you know, uh, gray, light gray. Uh, this will be important later on. And this black, black color is due to organic matter that is contained in these black barites uh, and some uh, parts even 0.3 weight percent. And the stable carbon isotopic composition of this is minus 28 per mil approximately, which again would be in the biological range. Now, so much about the barite, but associated with this black barite, and interestingly, only with the black barite, not the gray one, you have microbiolites. The one that you see here on top, which has this kind of reddish um, color. Um, what now appears to be red, uh, used to be gold. So if you look at drill core material uh, uh, from the dresser formation, you'll find that these microbiolites shown here in, in transmitted light um, appear to be dark. And if you have reflected light, they are in fact golden. So, okay, perhaps pyrite. And if you then check just element distribution on thin section scale by means of micro XRF mapping, for example, you'll see that you not only have enrichments of iron, which are indicative for the presence of the pyrite, but also zinc, uh, which is indicative for, in this case, for sphalerite. So in other words, these microbial mats originally consisted of metal sulfide minerals, pyrite and sphalerite. Now, what about the barite? I already said that it's kind of dark and you have organic matter in there, but what's even more interesting is that it's full of fluid inclusion. So small, tiny gas bubbles encapsulated within the crystals. There are two occurrences, so to speak. One is um, parallel to growth bands, as you can see here. Here's a close up. So you see all these tiny um, uh, fluid inclusions, but also kind of dispersed within crystals. These fluid inclusions are primary. These are no secondary. Uh, fluid inclusions, uh, secondary um, inclusions are the very, very exception here, uh, which means that these things were trapped while the barite was forming. Okay, so it's kind of a snapshot again, if you like. If you have now a closer look to these fluid inclusions, you will find that there are different types of. Um, the differences are mainly about, you know, the, the um, relative abundances of main gases, such as uh, carbon dioxide or H2S, but also uh, to the presence or absence of um, minor constituents. So, for example, these type one uh, fluid inclusions they contain nitrogen, whilst type two conclusions uh, inclusions contain methane. Um, the important thing here is now that you have apparently two coexisting fluids entrapped in 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 in, in barites that formed at relatively high temperatures. So. Homogenization temperatures uh, range between 100 and 195 uh, degrees Celsius, which is the minimum constraint for the temperature, the for formation temperature. And this tells us that these were hot fluids and that this phase separation is an effect um, uh, that or resulted or during by processes or as a result of processes that appear during cooling. Sorry. So, of course, this might imply that these time capsules can tell us more about the very nature of fluid seepage at this very time. And one good, again, method to, to learn more about this is GCMS. Um, so actually the same thing that I've introduced you to earlier on, but of course, this system uh, is designed in a way or adapted to the analysis of volatiles um, which you know you need a different column and such. I won't, don't want to bore you with details here, but we can use this technique. This is the important thing again to check for the uh, uh, molecular inventory, if you like. And this is what we did. Um, this is shown here: two chromatograms. These are you know two different approaches. 
um, I also don't want to swamp you here with the details. The very important thing is that these fluid inclusions contain many gases, some of which I, I uh, indicated here, highlighted here, that are relevant for biological processes. We know that. And now if you put the things into context, this means that these things would have been available for microbes thriving in the environment, okay? So why is this interesting? Uh, before I come to that, um, I have uh, want to first just to try to constrain the source of the organic matter a little bit. Um, what we did was we used um, stable carbon isotopes again to test whether we can say, you know, where the carbon dioxide, for example, originally derived from. Huh? Is it endogenic um, carbon dioxide or um, uh, biogenic ones or was formed by from former bi um, biological matter? And this is what we found. What you see here on the y-axis is stable carbon isotopic composition from minus two down to minus 16. And the interesting thing now is if you look at gray barites, so the ones that are not associated with these uh, microbial mats, this uh, carbon dioxide, and the isotopic composition of it is in a range that we know from magmatic sources, okay? Very, it's a very nice match actually. But the important thing is that if you look at, at CO2 from these black barites, this is systematically depleted as compared to that. You see this here, there are even some very you know, low values. And this is something that needs explanation. And one possible explanation is that you had oxidation of um, organic matter formed by organisms somewhere in the environment. And the CO2 deriving from that then ended up in these fluids. So again, this would fit well to this hydrothermal circulation idea. Um, and uh, also consider that the stable carbon isotopic composition of the bulk organic matter in the samples was also in the biological range. So perhaps this is the explanation. Okay. But now come to what we are actually interested in, at least me, and this is the geobiological significance. Um, just remember what we've seen. We have these black barites, and they have these fluid, uh, fluid inclusions, and these fluid inclusions contain things like methane, short chain organics. And barite, of course, is a sulfate mineral, and we also find in some solid inclusions in here, also in some fluid inclusions, uh, a solid phase, elemental sulfur. So sulfur, non-reduced sulfur was present, um, obviously. At the same time, we have this microbiolite sitting on top of this, originally um, consisting of metal sulfides. So one possible explanation, of course, would be uh, that organisms that formed this mat were utilizing whatever was delivered by these fluids, right? With sulfate or sulfate, sulfur, and by uh, methane and short chain organics, you would have all ingredients that you, you need to perform uh, sulfate reduction or uh, sulfur disproportionation. And the important thing is that at least with um, sulfate reduction, you would produce reduced sulfur species, which then for, can further react with iron and form um, iron minerals, such as the ones that we observed. So we could put all these things together and bundle it into a concise picture. So you may ask now um, about you know, evidence for the presence of sulfur-based microbes in this environment. Is there any? And the good thing is that yes, see papers by Shen and colleagues, Filippo and colleagues, and also um, and Baumgartner and colleagues. Um, we have evidence for the presence of sulfur-based microbes, whether these are sulfate reducers or sul uh, sulfur um, disproportionation. Uh, disproportionating uh, microbes is another question. Read these papers if you're interested in this, but uh, we can assume that the guys that we need to perform these processes were present. And I, this leads me to the bold statement that I think what we're looking here is really an ecosystem fueled by hydrothermal fluid flow. The fluids brought whatever these microbes needed and uh, they made the living out of that, so to speak. Okay. Uh, very short excursus. I'm almost finished. Oh, it's also late already. Sorry for that. Uh, one also interesting aspect, perhaps, that we found is that these fluid inclusions contained 
uh, molecules that are building blocks of methyl thioacetate. And this is very interesting because these things have been considered by some colleagues working on prebiotic stuff as being important for the origins of life because they are kind of key agents in primordial energy metabolisms. Well, I'm not a chemist and I really don't want to get into detail here, but I find it very remarkably that we find things that were you know, uh, observed in the lab and are considered important because of lab experience that we now have a really record for this. Um, I'm not saying that the dresser formation of course, is the site where life originated. Of course, this would be silly. I just make, try to make the case for life being present, but uh, we have a really old record of these things being present. And I think this is quite a remarkable thing and perhaps stimulate further research. Okay, coming to the end, wrapping everything up. Um, I start with a slide that you have already seen. If we want to understand how our modern world came into being, we need once again also to understand things that happened in the very distant past. Uh, actually, best would be to understand them directly once life emerged. And uh, the Pilbara Kraton, and this is also uh, not new, um, there you have many valuable records of life and environments on the early earth that can that help you to, to, to study these processes also in a very uh, high detail. And um, now coming to the things that we observe, uh, starting with the Stradipoo formation, my claim is that what we are looking at is a new type of microbial metfacies, which is important if you think about it, because we may should not only think about classic stromatolites when going to the field and looking for evidence of life, we may have to expand our language a little. And it's not only that we can make the case for life being present, also we may have some clues about metabolisms that played a role. So from identification to understanding. And uh, once again, the pres remarkable preservation of features here, is, in my opinion, it can best be uh, explained by an impregnation by silica rich fluids. Second example, dresser formation. We had this hydrothermal pump operating. We had this accumulation and redistribution of organic matter. This is very important if you think about sequestration of biological organic matter in veins, uh, because this of course could have had an influence on the carbon cycle, depending on which scale uh, we're talking about, right? But I think it's worth considering this in future studies. Another aspect, of course, is that the same processes in other microenvironments supplied fertile substrates to microbial communities. And maybe kind of side as, uh, uh, aspect, it may even help us a little to, you know, understand prebiotic processes a little better if it comes to, you know, building blocks, catalyst energy, and so on and so forth. We can use this information perhaps if we, you know, uh, do experiments and such. Okay, so this is the very final statement promised. What we can say about all these environments, these ecosystems and taphonomic processes were directly influenced by fluid seepage. And this of course emphasizes very nicely that hydrothermal fluid seepage has been important for the emergence of life. Uh, we really have to consider this. And I would like, to leave you with this. Sorry for uh, that it took a little longer than expected, uh, but anyways, happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks, JP. That was that was really great, and I particularly learned a lot. So we're going to trans we're going to start our sort of Q and A session now. So please ask questions that you think are more quick to answer and applicable to the broad audience. If you've got something that's going to generate some more specific discussion, we'll do a we'll do a discussion session after we get through everybody's questions. So we'll give people some time to uh, either type their question up or raise their hand and try to get a, get to everybody in the order that we get get these questions. So Gordon Love asks. Did you see any ice, isoprenoids in your dresser pyrolysis product from chlorophyll fragments? I got unfortunately not. No. It was all only aromatic hydrocarbons and, uh, and the, the alkynes. Um, 
Hi, JP, and maybe I start with one question. So uh, about Australia uh, stromatolites and overlined by microbial mats, um, if I understand stromatolites have some silica in them, but we are not fully silicified, whereas microbial mats uh, silicify. So I'm just wondering uh, how you put them together in terms of water depth. Uh, is it possible that microbial mats were deposited in more uh, deeper water setting and um, they represent like a condensed intervals where, where sort of silica uh, slowly percolated and silicified microbial mats or how do you see it? Okay, uh, but so you mean that they formed in deeper water depths or that they were like, transported into uh, like electronos? Uh, in more deeper water compared to stromatolites? Like, do you think we're more deeper or more shallow compared to stromatolites? Water depth is always a critical uh, thing, of course, uh, because what we basically only have in these old records are may indications that, you know, indicate some sort of hydrodynamic um, um, agitation, so to speak. Um, so whenever something does not show cross depth or so, people tend to claim that it must have been deep water which of course does not have to be the case. So um, to ask a quick question, I think because we have this, this facious association with these classic stromatolites below that have been mapped out by um, Alwood, for example, and also Martin von Grandonk, you see really this facious distribution, which seems to you know, follow hydrodynamic rules a little. Um, I would say that we are in shallow water in environment. If you now, um, take as hypothesis that these microbial mats, these silicify ones were like carried down somewhere. So allochthonously, um, then I would have to ask for the evidence for these very mechanisms. I don't see that. Second is, um, I mean, this would mean that you would have like, like an increase in water depth quite suddenly, right? Because it's directly on top of these stromatolites. Um, so I think it's shallow water based on all that. But I don't think that stromatolites that we observe in the, in the fossil record necessarily have to be shallow water. I think this is a misconception. Of course, most of the Precambrian things are most likely cyanobacterial in, in origin, no, no, no question of that. But still, we also have cases, also in the fossil record, by the way, where we have stromatolites that look pretty much like, you know, once formed by cyanobacteria, but then were formed by, for example, the anaerobic oxidation of methane, where you don't have and need any sunlight. The only answer, so in other ways, theoretically, you could form things also in deeper settings. Um, but microbial mat mineralization is a very complex and tricky biz, uh, business. So you really have to make the case, uh, you know, from case to, from case, to case. This makes sense. I don't know whether I answered your question or just uh, talked to you dizzy. Yeah, I, I didn't comply with microbial mats deeper water, but I was wondering how you put them away more shallow compared to facies compared to stromatolites or more deeper facies. Sort of, uh, is it upward uh, deepening cycle or upward shallow cycle? Oh, hard to tell, hard to tell. This is really, I don't know. I mean, you see, we see similar things uh, like in Lake Magadi where water depths were not deep. Uh, and I mean, shallow, shallow. Um, we have these hydrothermal ponds. So these things can also form in uh, shallow water environments. So perhaps it's not a change in water depth, but rather maybe a change in the environmental conditions in the nature of fluid seepage, maybe. Um, but really hard, hard, to, hard to tell. Thank you. All right, next question is from Juan Kui. My impression is that sulfate concentrations in the Archean Ocean was very low. So there, where is the sulfate from during barite mineralization? Excellent question, huh? Yeah, I mean, this is always the thing. You always hear that sulfate um, concentrations were very low. Of course, they were compared to today, perhaps. But in the moment that you have a, a source like hydrothermal fluids, you may bring in sulfate from different sources. The origin of the sulfates 
um, are still disputed right, of the Barites. I have to say, there are different ideas. There are even ideas that this is uh, actually already like oxy, you know, weathering, and you brought everything in. Uh, but I will now shift this aside. If you take the other ideas, you can have photolytic processes in the atmosphere that can account for the formation of sulfate. For example, if you have volcanism going on and then just reactions of the emitted substances um, in the atmosphere. The other thing is uh, hydrothermal processes in the crust. And I showed you, I may just go back this very nice color of these basaltic rocks. Where is it? Sorry for that. Here, this whitish kaolinite. So you had hydrothermal weathering, if you like, in situ weathering. And there are processes like argillic, I hope I pronounce it correctly, uh, alteration, where you will form sulfate, even under unoxic, otherwise unoxic conditions. So one uh, explanation might be that the sulfate derived from this hydrothermal um, weathering uh, and was sourced by, if you like, by these, uh, by these fluids then, or transported by these, by these fluids. Um, it's a very interesting discussion really. Also, if it comes to the detailed arguments, um, if, you, if, you, if you want to you know, delve into that, there are papers again by Martin von Kanog and Piranio. I, I'm always not sure if I pronounce his name correctly, but uh, I'm happy to send them if you, if, if you want. I prefer hydrothermal origin here, I should say, but this is gut feeling. I, I don't have data for that. All right, we've cycled through questions. So let's just go ahead and have a more informal discussion. Anybody who'd like to go ahead and speak up, start some more specific discussion, feel free. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Peter, that was awesome. And I'm totally persuaded that sulfur is where it's at in the Archean, uh, makes total sense. Um, I've got three questions. Um, some of them are a bit persnickety, I suppose. Where did the gray barite that you analyzed for carbon isotopes come from? You showed us the black, but what's, what does the gray barite look like? Is it, is yeah. it the stuff with the inclusions or somewhere else altogether? So both barites, this gray one and also the black one, is you find this in hydrothermal veins. So these, these churn veins, they pass into these barite veins, if you like. And then you find it also embedded form whenever it you know, came out, it seems, uh, mapping evidence. So it's pretty much the same story behind that. Uh, it just looks different. It also has fluid inclusions, also as you know, in the same abundancy. The only difference is really the organic uh, stuff, which so, is- So, so, so the, the black is in the feeders and then the gray is in the bedded, is that- No, how? no, 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 you can have both okay. in embedded form. You can find uh, both. Excellent. Yeah. My, my second question is, um, did, why, I saw Don Lowe was on. I don't know if he's still there, but um, why didn't you think about narcolite for the pseudohexagonal crystal pseudomorphs? Narcolite is a, a, um, a sodium carbonate that Don documented from a number of Archean terrains. So, uh, it's be unusual for aragonite to be pseudohexagonal, I think. Yeah, yeah, good point. I mean, um, like always, of course, with these old things, and this is, I have to admit, the things are also the argumentation derives much from, from context. So what we do was that we found other carbonates. I mean, I now started with the aragonite, but of course, first we observed the other carbonate. And um, we observed similar things in other hydrothermal environments, in younger environments. So this is why we uh, did this interpretation. But um, I was, I hope, I, I also phrased this carefully enough. Uh, of course, we are not absolutely certain. What we, for example, not have are trace elemental data that could support an aragonite origin or something like this. So it might well be that the precursor was also something different. I would not rule this out. Huh? Yeah, the, the, your argument about concept makes perfect sense to me because, and that's, that's why I'm interested because narcolite is of course a plier lake mineral like you would get in Lake Magadi whereas um, aragonite tends to be more marine. Yeah, I mean, uh, one has to be a little careful with this, I think, because fluid chemistry and the mixing of fluids of different composition can really make a lot. And uh, uh, I don't know, these, we, we know so little about these fluids uh, that I would not, you know, um, 
make a bold statement here. Yeah. But what we, for example, know here in this area, southern Germany, we have some uh, impact craters. Uh, very famous is the Ries crater, but there's also a smaller one um, of about the same age. And in the very central part, in the central hill of this, of this crater, you have carbonate blocks. Uh -huh. And apparently, based on descriptions, I haven't seen this myself, unfortunately, yet, um, what was found there were aragonite fans uh -huh. uh, that were preserved within. Um, my idea how this formed um, is um, that you had mixing again of fluids. So it's like an artesian spring, you had fluids coming into the system and they hit the lake water, different composition, and you had the precipitation going on. And I could envision a similar mechanism here. But again, <laughs> I tried to, to, to uh, phrase this, uh, I don't know the English word for this, but with really relative wording, uh, could, would, should, uh, I'm not sure. Um, yeah. and, and my final question is, um, have you thought at all about um, sulfur oxidizing bacteria creating the barite? No, simply because we don't have any evidence for that. Uh, that's, uh, I mean, of course, that's, that's always kind of the restriction that we face. We have to, to, to work with what, what we find. You, and, do have, uh, you do have carrageen molecules that are pretty complicated and uh, interesting isotopic signatures. Yeah, but still you would have to pinpoint this, no? And I'm pretty sure that many sulfur guys and geomicrobiologists would uh, even stop me <laughs> when I uh, would go on about metabolisms like, like I did. Uh, these processes are so complex. And then I ha yes. one has to, to consider that the barite, it's really massive. It's very massive. And right. if we take all this picture, you have this, this it, I mean, it's mined there, no? You have this, this massive barite and then you have the barite that's, within these hydrothermal veins, how would you explain the, the, bar, um, the barite in these hydrothermal veins? So I'm um, not sure. I'm sure that of course, what we see if it comes to metabolisms is only a very minor fraction, but this is always the case. This is always the case. It's also the case if we talk about stromatolites being formed by cyanobacteria because microbiomats consists of, you know, <laughs> so many microbes doing different things. We can only talk about key players, or things that might be, you know, by chance uh, preserved uh, because of taphonomic processes. So a bias, if you like. Um, I'm getting drifted off a little, I feel. I should go back to your point. Um, my point is that I first see no direct evidence for it. At least I haven't noticed any. Second, if I consider the whole picture of the whole environment, it's hard for me to envision this to be really to account for these masses of barite, and then especially to explain the barite within the hydrothermal, uh, hydrothermal veins. Great, thanks a lot. Thank you. All right, Gordon, I'm gonna address something in the chat real quick, and then you can go next. Um, Lyle Nelson asked, in terms of silicification as a preservational process, is it possible to distinguish hydrothermal Solicification, example of Rhiney chert from marine or surface fluid flow driven by genesis due to higher silica concentrations in the Archean. Do you think one of these processes is better at creating taphonomic potential? I think that this is, again, quite complicated to answer, especially if it comes to the early Archean. You know, if, if, if the privilege to to work together with some geochemists, isotope geochemists who do oxygen isotopies, and they used to check chert you know, through Earth's history and uh, to learn something about the temperature of the fluid. And what you see is that you start somewhere, if you calculate temperatures uh, with 80 degrees Celsius or something, and then it just goes all the way down through Earth's history. And uh, the question always is why? Um, was the isotopic composition of the, you know, um, ocean or whatever the setting was different? Um, do you have diagenesis going on that just changes these things systematically over time? And um, it's quite controversial. Uh, my point here, why I'm bringing this up is that even if you have relatively well-established systems, it seems to me, it's hard really to you know make a solid conclusion on this. Then second thing, silica, um, you know, 
is is very tricky. Uh, if I go to the calcareous alp, for example, and I go to limestones or go to the chalk, uh, Cretaceous chalk, you will find also um, chert nodules that preserve fossils in many cases. And the the question whether or not uh, silica precipitates or a mineral precipitates out of that uh, seems to depend really on very uh, particular you know processes and con conditions. And I'm not sure if we are really able to unravel these processes in these very old rocks. Um, yeah. I'm but, glad yes. Can, yes, I that one, what, can I add one thing? If you go, yeah, go to, to, to hydrothermal systems of the deep sea, like these black smoker stuff things, and you look what paleontologists found also in relatively old stuff is that you have filaments of iron oxidizers, these very nice filaments that you find them commonly in shirt facies. So not in the hot zone where you have the chimney, not in the adjacent zone where it's still quite hot, but in the zone where you have temperatures that um, result, or result in the precipitation you know, of, of chert or whatever, chert precursors. And apparently in these environments, you will get these tiny uh, and very fragile filaments preserved, uh, which tells me that it's perhaps not a question of the, you know, of water depth, ocean versus terrestrial or something, but again, rather depends on the, on the nature of fluids that are involved at a certain point, and not only the chemistry, but also things like temperature. Um, I don't know whether this, uh, if I answered the question with this, but. Yeah, Lyle said thank you in the chat. I think okay. it's also a complicated okay. question too. Yeah, um, otherwise. Gordon. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks for a great talk, JP. Okay. I just, uh, going back to the slide you, you compared, you showed two chromatograms. One was from the dresser. Yeah. Formation pyrolysis. Yeah, compared to the Fisher Tropes uh, product here. But it, I think, in reality, it could be more complicated than this because if your Fisher Tropes products have not undergone like geological maturation where they would crack even more, right? So they might end up with a more lower molecular weight profile once they've been through that process. So is there anything in terms of like the branched or cyclic compounds in the kerogen that could distinguish it from the Fisher Tropes? Because you could end up with a very similar N-alkane Mm. Profile. There is a big drop off in C18, definitely, right? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, but is, it, is that anything within, right, either the, the carbon isotope systematics or within the branch cyclic that could distinguish these if you cracked your FTT product further? Yeah. Uh, first of all, that's true. I mean, if you would, you know, do experiments with this, with these uh, Fisher Tropsch yeah. products, uh, like maturation. Uh, um, experiments, and we did this, you will, of course, shift everything to, towards shorter chain length. But what we observed was that you will always keep like this unimodal distribution. You would just shift yeah. it down. Um, but these maturation experiments were conducted, of course, with something that would be free lipids or whatever in the environment. So not a kerogen, right? This leads uh -huh. me to the second problem. We don't know, actually, if there's something like a fischer tropsch type kerogen, uh, hasn't been yeah. found yet. I mean, could be that these things are defunctionalized within the environment so quickly that you cannot yeah. you know, build up mm -hmm. kerogen in, in, in high amounts. Um, we, we, we simply don't know. If it comes to branched um, alkynes and such, if you have little um, maturation, then perhaps yes. Because we know that, you know, Fischer Chops, again, you will always have the statistic distributions of compounds, but we know that organisms tend to, you know, uh, do certain varieties of this IA or mm -hmm. I case or so. So uh, there might be something hidden, but whether we can apply this to very old stuff is a different question. Yeah. I think more promising perhaps uh, would be to look at aromatics and to see how they transform. And whether you yeah. would, for example, form um, distinct aromatic patterns yeah. if you um, cook this, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. We just published something on that in astrobiology with Keldon. 
yeah. I just make my PhD yeah. student read it. <laughs> so, uh, so famously, like Tom McCollum, but it's, it's based around one experiment, right? But blew the carbon isotope arguments out the water that fisher tropes could produce organics with a 35 per mil fractionation. Did you measure delta C13 for your FTT products? No. And also it would be, I mean, it would depend on the oxalic um, acid that we use as a precursor yeah. material, if you like. Uh, we didn't check for systematics, but one um, aspect to that, maybe that, that might be important if we, if we think about old stuff. It's true that they found experimentally that you have can have carbon isotope fractionation to an extent that you end up with signatures that resemble biological signatures. But it was just, it, it was not, you know, consistently the case. No? You end yep. up with a range of different isotopes, which is very different than to biology, where you always have this discrete range of isotopies, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is one of the best arguments to, to argue that, that the organic matter contained in many of these old rocks, at least of this age now, uh, but are biological in origin. I would expect some kind of fluctuation in the stable carbon isotopic yep. composition if this should be all abiotic. Yep. This is one thing. Second thing is, it's not that easy that you just have, you know, a serpentinization going on and then you will form fischer tropsch type products. Uh -huh. It really depends on so many parameters, minerals, um, the, the grain size of the minerals and the chemistry of the minerals, temperatures and all that. Um, so I'm, it's, it's, it's very hard for me to envision that this should re really result in the buildup of, of high amounts of, of organic matter on the, on, the, on the early earth. But um, of course, this is, um, I guess you can read this in different ways. Um, but this, this would be my idea about yeah. this. Yeah, I think I agree that I would expect the Fisher tropes to produce a wide range of delta C13s or have the capability of producing a very, very wide range of delta C13. Unfortunately, the McCollum papers are based around one experiment, right? They didn't really vary conditions or vary the vary uh, the yields, right? The conversion yields, because it's got to, it should depend on that from first principles. So, but they only they only seem to focus on the experiment that matched the biological signal. Yeah, yeah, but uh, this is also, I mean, this is a problem with these experiments, no? Helge did many of those, and it yeah. really sometimes depends on minor differences if, 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 you, if you create something or not. Yeah. Um, which also shows you that you, you know, these things depend on so many things. So um, it's hard for me, and I mean, besides, we, we, we should go for the explanation that is more plausible. Uh, and uh, requires less assumptions. So for me, it's just more plausible. But of course, uh, I understand if people are uh, critical about this. I, I'm not a big fan, for example, of this nil hypothesis, because if you use, apply the nil hypothesis in a very strict sense, so it means you can only speak about a biosignature or interpret something as biosignatures if you rule out all possible abiotic processes that might have resulted in this very signature, then you, would, you, you won't get anywhere. Uh, yeah. Because all, for all features we observe, there are some you know, cases where you could also produce this abiotically. Um, so for me, um, the easiest explanation where we can just you know, get all these things together into a consistent model, I would say, is, is biology. Yep, thanks. So, uh, JP, since we are on this slide, maybe for people who are not organic JP chemists like myself, uh, so the reason uh, it's uh, for cyanobacterium, it stops at 18, is it it's typical of all bacteria and it's just how uh, bacteria produce organic matter. So, it's nothing to do with high pi, even if you would analyze cyanobacteria that didn't go, that you didn't process for high pi, it would still drop at 18? Yeah, I mean, if we, if we just analyze it so, we would find the corresponding fatty acids to that. So the precursor molecules in the cyanobacteria were fatty acids. So what high pi actually does is that it trees out of the, the functional group, if you, if you like. And uh, we know that in fatty acids, um, we also have a preference um, and it's usually 
the, 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 the fatty acid with 16 carbon atoms and the one with 18 carbon atoms. Uh, so this is very, very consistent. And if you would uh, take eukaryote and do high pi, would you also uh, drop at 18 or not? I mean, theoretically, you could do that. Um, claiming to eukaryotes to be present at this time <laughs> would be a little problematic. So our argumentation uh, is actually, if we take the domains of life, um, eukaryotes are just unlikely at this time, at least if we take now our current knowledge about the world back then, um, then you would have a Kia, which don't have the capability, at least it's not known to really, you know, produce straight chain molecules, biosynthetic pathways and such. Um, I don't want to get into much into detail that. And the only candidate you're left with then would be bacteria. Yeah. So just jump in here, JP, because uh, we sort of like done quite a, a lot of analysis on different cultures. The, the eukaryotes, the algae will give longer chain patterns than that, Andre. Like green algae give all the way up to like NC34. They have lots of waxy. But bacteria generally give shorter, right? But it's not just specifically cyanobacteria. Like bacteria will give short chain N alkanes. Archaea will give isoprenoidal hydrocarbons. And algae will give, uh, and eukaryotes will give longer chain than what they're actually showing on the cyanobacterium one. But you can find, again, it's one of those things, right? You can find bacteria that make some long chain stuff. And then you can find occasionally some eukaryotes that make shorter chain, but that's the general pattern. That That's a typical bacterial signal, but not specifically cyanobacterial. Yeah, 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 sorry. That, I, I should emphasize this uh, yeah. too. Huh? Yeah. Uh, and uh, we have a question from Daryl, how much raw material is needed for high fi carriage and analysis? Oh, I can't recall really. I have to look this up, I have to admit, but it was quite a bit because we had to get, what, what we did was that we get rid of all the silica by using hydrofluoric acid and so on and so forth. And we concentrated everything up. So it was quite a bit. I have to admit, I, I don't have the exact number, but it's not that you just take a, what we call princess uh, sample. <laughs> it has a few centimeters or so, but uh, this was really a big block. Also because of course we had, we, we, we removed all the surfaces, no? So the sample we took in the, in the field, it was really a big chunk. Um, the reason is simply that we had to cut off all the surfaces to make sure uh, that uh, it's not affected by endolytic organisms or so, um, which can also, you know, introduce organic stuff into your sample. And uh, uh, another question, JP. So for this, um, so you showed this uh, nanoseams data for, mm -hmm. I think for Australia pool, right? Uh, yes. And uh, you argued that uh, uh, the inner part was carbonate, but uh, but wouldn't you expect that for carbonate you should get a low signal uh, because uh, carbonate has also calcium and oxygen and has less uh, uh, carbon twelve, uh, more carbon thirteen. Uh, did you try to do to also map calcium or magnesium uh, that would kind of help you to establish that central part is carbonate? Yeah, that's true. Uh, we didn't. Uh, the problem is a little that we were limited in terms of isotopes that we can measure. And this instrument, I think you have seven slots, so you can analyze seven um, um, different isotopes. And if you have 12C, 13C, then you have the two nitrogen um, um, isotopes, you have two sulfur, then you're almost there. Second is, I'm not sure if it's possible to get these ions with this technique. This is always also a little, uh, the problem with, with SIMS techniques that you cannot get everything with everything. Um, I'm not sure, I, I have to say, whether it would be possible. Uh, third thing is, we are looking at relative enrichments. No? We are not talking about absolute abundances. Uh, this was also not our intention. So we can only tell that there's carbon in 
present in higher amounts as compared to here, for example, but we cannot say what the absolute quantities are. And uh, so this is why, uh, you know, we didn't get, go, go further. But this is also why uh, there's a question mark. <laughs> Working hypothesis, so to speak. Okay, good. Okay, if nobody else has more points. Okay, I just got one. It was a direct message from K. Sender. In the black ferrite to stromatolite transition, the transition seems to have occurred very fast. If yes, any particular reason, or is this just a product of low deposition rates? Uh, again, I have to say, <laughs> I don't have an idea about this. It's true. You also see that the, during mineralization that you kind of had like minute movements. So you see a slight displacement of the stromatolites at, at the base. Uh, for us, the important thing to observe was that first, the barite does not replace the microbiolites. We never observed this. And we didn't find any um, uh, relict materials, so to speak, within the barite that would tell us that there was replacement going on. Uh, about the, you know, time that is captured within there, I really don't have uh, an idea. And I'm also not sure how these materials would behave once formed. Uh, so if you have this barite being formed and you have microbial mats, it's perhaps at the same time, perhaps a little later, and in, 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 in these consist have this iron uh, minerals in there, and then you have also much organic matter in the microbial mat, of course, so it's kind of slimy thing. I would not, I have absolutely no idea what this means in terms of, um, you know, uh, mechanical behavior or behavior upon stress, so hard, hard to tell. Does this make sense? I hope. Yeah, I think so. Um, all right. Do we have anybody else who'd like to Bring up any points, ask anything. All right, then. Thanks a whole lot, JP. This was a really great talk and fun discussion. Thank so you, guys. Thanks. Thanks for presenting. And Thank next you. week, we will have Lydia presenting, right? Yeah. Uh, Alex Lydia Sharma. The information probably later this week. Yeah. All right, everybody. Uh, take care. See you next time. See ya. Bye.